So this morning, um, if you haven't gathered by now, we are going to be talking about the Christmas story. <laughs> um, uh, we're going to uh, read from Luke chapter 2, verses um, 1 through to 8. Did I put 18? Um, so in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. And this was the first registration when Carinus was the governor of Syria. And all well went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, he betrothed, and who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no space for them at the inn. So last week, um, we, we spoke about the star that led the wise men to where Jesus was born. And, and as I was uh, thinking about um, this week, how we can start this Lenten service off, although I started it early last week, um, um, I, I wanted to focus on three things about the um, nativity scene that we see. There's the star and the stable and the manger. Right? So um, the star is what the, the, the wise men were guided by. And it's actually funny when you look up the, the, the history of um, stars, because I thought, well, why were they following stars and how could they tell? Because they came to the king, I don't know if you remember from the week, last week, and they said to him, where's this king that was come from Jerusalem? We saw his star. And so really when you do research and you look, Balaam, I don't know if you remember who he was. He was a prophet. He wasn't a Christian, but he was uh, the one who God spoke through the jaws of a donkey through in the Old Testament in Numbers. And he actually prophesied that there would be this coming star. And, and so these wise men were from the east. And the stars, mind you, I did some astrology research, whatever. Not that I understand everything there. It just goes way over my head. But anyway, I just go. But, but all the new stars or whatever are discovered, they all come from the east. So, hey, who knew? So, if any time they discover a new star, it comes from the east. So, that's what they say. And there's a whole lot of jargon, but I don't want to bore you with all of that stuff about how this, you would be falling asleep. I didn't want you to be falling asleep. I want you to pay attention. But, but anyway, it was just so interesting for me to figure out that from the, the Old Testament, Balaam actually um, had made this prophecy, which is what the wise men would have read because they weren't Christian and they knew about this king of the Jews that was coming. And so they came, and last week we learned about how they came and they were looking for this king and how they were guided by this light in the sky. You know, so um, we also go the other way um, when we look at the stars and then start worshipping the stars. I can remember in my before engaged, married days. Um, my, she's now my sister-in-law, but we were roommates at the time, my friend, and I lived um, in an apartment together uh, when I was first working. And um, you know how it is, you go out and you meet, meet people, meet boys, and there was this, I met boys, I, but anyway, there was this guy that we, we, we met, but he, he liked my roommate, but he was one of those kind of guys that was not so sure of himself. And so he would never just ask her out. He would take both of us out. <laughs> so I was like, bonus. <laughs> I could do this. <laughs> so he, like, he didn't really date us, but it's okay. He paid for all the things. He'd take us out for dinner. He'd, take, he'd buy tickets to shows. And in South Africa, they didn't have, um, you know, we had sanctions in South Africa. So we didn't have concerts like you guys have. So if anybody ever came to South Africa, there was this place called Sun City. It was kind of in Baputatswana. It was a little, it's kind of like Swaziland, part of South Africa, but you have to, it's considered uh, independent state, right? So Sun City would host these, these people and we, we, you would go there. And I mean, the one day he, he phoned up my roommate and said, hey, would you like to go and see, I can't remember who the band was anyway. Would you like to go and see this band? And I'm like, are you kidding me? 
we can't afford that. So she, she goes, no, well, we can't really afford it. And he goes, no, no, I, I'll buy the tickets. And so she goes, well, Shemaine and I were actually planning. And so he goes, no, I'll, I'll pay for all of both of you. And I'm like, yeah, bonus. <laughs> anyway, the story is this guy was wanting to date my friend. But he consulted an astrologer, you know? He, he, he was one of those kind of wacky guys. We only found this out afterwards, which is why he ended up paying for these tickets. Because this astrologer, whatever she was, star, whatever you call them, I don't know, she told him that on this night, you know, when the concert was, at 6.10, like seriously, she even had the time down. I was like, what? So, so at 10 past 6 that night, he would be kissed by a girl, and that girl was going to be his future wife. But he didn't tell us this, right? He didn't tell us this. So we at this concert and, you know, having fun and enjoying. And about, <laughs> about almost 10 after 6, <laughs> he starts making moves on my friend, you know? <laughs> anyway, so she's going to me. <laughs> you know, one of those like, get out of here. Like, this guy's crazy. But anyway, um, so we, we, we skipped out. But then the rest of the night, this guy was in such a bad mood. We couldn't understand what the heck was going on. So anyway, we're driving home. It's like a two-hour drive from this place. And so he, he's upset. So I was like, Kevin, why are you so upset? Like, what's going on? Like, what, what's the matter? You know, did something happen? And then he proceeds to tell us about this woman that he consults about his future. And then he told us what, that she said at 10 past 6 that night. <laughs> so, of course, my friend and I look at each other. I was like, okay, that makes sense now. While it was, why, at 9 minutes past 6, he was trying to make a move on you. <laughs> I'm glad it was her, not me. <laughs> but anyway, it, you know, it's funny, but seriously, this guy was so involved with this, um, this woman, and he would consult her. Like, he paid her good money to tell her his future, right? And, and I was like, how sad is that, that you are paying someone, oh, tell me, I'll pay me, I'll tell you your future, <laughs> Right? So, but, but he was dead serious about it, and he actually lived his life by what this woman said. And, you know, I know there are these star horoscopes or whatever in the newspapers, which to me really, I did at one stage when I was younger. I, 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 I used to love reading them. Oh, yeah, today's going to be a good day. <sighs> really? <laughs> Today you're going to meet somebody that will mean something to you. Really? <laughs> But when you're younger, you believe that stuff, right? It's like when you go to the Chinese restaurant and you get your, your lucky numbers. How come they're in there? If you play the lotto, you play these numbers, really. Why are they in the little Chinese biscuit? Why hasn't everybody got the numbers then, right? But anyway. But, but that's what the, the point of this is that, you know, when we look at the created instead of the creator, right? God created the stars, and that star guided the wise men. And really and truly, when you read in the Bible, you read in Revelations about the woman with the seven stars on the top of her head, it referred to angels. It referred to a divine guidance. So that's what I'm trying to say, that um, we can look at, look at things for guidance, but we can't worship that. We need to worship God, right? And... So the point of the star is, when we look at the nativity um, scene, I want us this Christmas to look at it and realize that that star that guided the wise men was a divine direction, right? He gives divine direction. God gives us divine direction. It's not like you are reading your horoscope or you're going to consult with a psychic because that's also big, hey? Like big on the, on the, on the um, TV nowadays. They have these psychics that contact you or makes you feel better about yourself. Like, really. You know, so, but, but when you look at um, how in Revelations even they refer to the woman with the 12 stars and um, it, talks, it refers to church leaders and it talks about the, the stars in the Bible actually represent um, the angels and divine leadership in, and, and what is used for guidance. And, and when we are talking about um, the star of, the, of Bethlehem that guided those 
wise men to the right place. And that's what I want to remember too, is that there wasn't just any star. It was a star that took them to exactly where they needed to be and what they needed to know. But so we can go and consult with psychics or fortune tellers or whatever they are, but seriously, those people are like thumb-sucking it, right? They really not, they don't know anything. I mean, when we, when we ask God, he gives us the guidance that we need to be exactly where we need to be. So that star, we don't celebrate the star, we celebrate the God who created that star, who gives us the guidance in that area, right? So, so that brings me to the next part of it is the stable. You know, when we look at this, the nativity story, we see that Jesus came um, in the story in Luke, he had to go and be registered. The family needed to go and register. Joseph had to go and register his family. And so they took, so they took um, the journey to Bethlehem, but there was no place at the inn. And they were, he was born in a, in, in a stable. So really and truly, when you look at a stable, I think in the nativity scenes, because I, I, have, I have one at home, we are sitting. I was, actually was going to bring it this morning to put it here, but um, I, was, I was looking at it and I thought, wow, whenever you look at all these nativity scenes, it really looks so inviting and comfy. But really, think about it. Where they would have been was the streets would have been crowded and, and the stables were like in caves in, in, in the rock, right? So it really was pushed back and the animals would be in the back of it. And I mean... Really, animals stink, man. <laughs> There's nothing nice smelling about it. And that would have been crowded because can you imagine how many people were there at that time? Because they were all coming to Bethlehem to, to be counted. Like there was a census going on, right? So they were all getting squished in, in there. So, so can you imagine? There's probably like sheep and cattle and poop and everything all over the place, right? Like, it could be pleasant. It wasn't, but you, you know what that reminded me? Um, when you look at it, you go, you know what? God sent Jesus. He could have sent him to the Hilton. He could have sent him to the king's palace. But he didn't. He sent him to a stable, which to me is a symbolic of the fact that Jesus was not sheltered from real life. He wasn't sheltered from real life. Jesus was born amongst the stink, <laughs> right? It smelled. It wasn't pleasant. There was nothing glorious about it. There was nothing glamorous about it, right? He came among man. He came at our level. He came where he could re- we, we could respond, right? That's, that's how he worked. And he worked... Think about it. Jesus was a refugee before he was one years old. Remember, we spoke last week when we read that Bible story. His dad had to take him to Egypt because the king was going to kill him. So he knows what it's like to flee to another country. right? He worked in construction. He was a, he was a, a woodworker. He knows what it feels like to probably hit your, na- your thumb with a nail, <laughs> a hammer, <laughs> and it hurts. <laughs> right? He probably knew what it was like to have calluses on his hands. Right? Or unhappy customers bringing the product back, being mean to you, right? He had friends just like we have. He lived without advantage. He didn't go and live in the, in the palace and speak to the low people, you know? He didn't. He, he walked the streets. He lived amongst the people. He grew up. You know, I always think of those words um, when Mary and Joseph had, had gone to the temple when he was 12 years old and, and they lost him. <laughs> and then they realized they had to go back for him. And they're like, what are you doing? And he goes, well, didn't you know I would be in my father's house? Um, but there's a, 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 I think there's a few words that people don't really ever take notice of it. Um, I can, can you imagine? He got scolded by his mother. He was in trouble, <laughs> right? He got in trouble too. So he was a disobedient teenager, <laughs> I should imagine. And uh, I just always think of the fact that it says to us that Jesus went home with his parents and he was obedient to them and he grew in stature. So he had to grow up with the same. And that was always a reminder to me that 
yeah, he really did lead the same kind of a life that he can really speak to, to us. You know, we think that he's this God up in heaven who doesn't understand the thing that's going on in our lives. But he, he suffered rejection. He re- suffered ridicule. He suffered abandonment. Jesus went through all those things. So wherever we are at in our lives, he can speak into that. Amen? You know, so that stable is a reminder of the fact that Jesus humbled himself and came for us. It's God with us, Emmanuel. Amen? Isn't that so cool? So if you feel that nobody understands you, you're in a dark place, just remember that stable. Remember that Jesus didn't lead a sheltered life. It was unsheltered. And that he has an absolute grasp of what's going on in your life. And we need to humble ourselves and trust him and allow him to minister to us. Amen? Yeah. So now, um, this brings us to the manger. And in reality, I think most of us wouldn't have known if it wasn't for the nativity story, unless you're a farmer. I wouldn't have known what a manger was. It's really a feeding trough. That's what it is. You know? And when we look at that manger, we see how God took something very ordinary and made it extraordinary. Because that manger is now recognized by everybody. Not as a feeding trough, but as the bed of a king. So something very ordinary became extraordinary. Isn't that so cool? That that now... um, I can see this God who is guiding me by the light, who is among me and understands my problem, and he can take my ordinary life and make it into something extraordinary. How cool is that? You know, and I I honestly and truly never ever in my wildest dreams ever thought that I would be where I am today doing what I'm doing today. Because I was a very ordinary girl who lived a very ordinary life dysfunctional, funny, funky life, right? We went out with guys who <laughs> worshipped the stars, like consulted astrologers to tell him who his next wife was going to be, right? You know, so, so whereas, um, who knew these years later, I could actually use that story to relate to a Bible story. How cool is that? How ordinary was that situation and how extraordinary is it that we can say, wow, We serve a mighty God, right? That something so very ordinary became extraordinary. That is the cool part, right? So, um, because not only does God changes our lives. I mean, I did go to church and I I read Bible stories to my kids. I I brought them up to the best of what I thought was a Christian. But like I say, I would be last in, first out, in, in, but when we came to Canada, I realized that was my turning point in life with my Christian walk with God. And I realized that I couldn't do any of it without Jesus Christ in my life. I couldn't live my life the way I was living it. It wasn't healthy. It was dysfunctional. It was uh, controlled by my mother, who was very controlling. And um, I, I didn't even know who I was. I didn't even know what I liked. I didn't even know what I would... I, I worked in the bank because my father told me I had to go and get a safe job, <laughs> right? And, and I just think that when I allowed God to work in my life, he changed me. Like, he took me from banking to being a pastor and working at the girls' home. It's crazy. Like, I would never have thought of that. Never, never, not in my wildest dreams, that that God would take my life and turn it around and that I can in turn bless him with it. And that's why I want us to remember that, um, you know, where we are hard, God can make us soft. Where we are people pleasers, we can become God pleasers, right? Where we are um, selfish and self-centered, God can make us tender and, and loving and caring towards other people when we see things through the eyes of God. You see, we, we can be given generosity. We can be given love and tenderness. And so, so what I'm asking you is, will you allow Jesus to transform 
the ordinary into the extraordinary in your life this Christmas season. And as we look at this manger scene and have a new understanding that it's not just a nativity. It's a symbol of something beautiful, that Jesus came among us. He humbled himself. That guiding light is directly related to improving your lifestyle, not destroying your lifestyle. God has no intention of saying, he's not a spiteful God. He doesn't want to go, follow me, and uh, if you don't follow me, I'm just going to nail you. He doesn't. He lets you live in, in the consequences of your actions. So if you're miserable, that's your fault. I hate to tell you that, <laughs> but you made the choice, right? But we don't have to live that way. But we can. We can look at, you know, I think of last week when we spoke about the three kings, um, the wise men that came, and when they came, they found this kid in this house, like ordinary. It wasn't a palace. It wasn't anything fancy. But what did they do? They didn't withhold their gifts. Remember, I said they gave it to him. They gave their best to God, right? They gave their gifts, and they fell on their knees in worship. They fell on their knees in worship. And so for us, we could, we could take that nativity scene this Christmas, this season, and look at it and go, yeah, that's cute. <laughs> that's nice. And I, and I know it may seem sacrilegious, but I don't know if you've ever seen Mr. Bean. You know Mr. Bean, that guy? There's one thing where he plays with a nativity set. It's hilarious. Yeah, I love it. I love I know it's not right, but it's funny. It's so funny because he'll walk behind and he'll go, Mwah, Mwah. but it's hilarious. You should look it up on the internet. It's so funny. But, you know, we could look at it as that way. It could be a joke or it could be um, just, oh, well, it is what it is. But what I want us to do this Christmas season is to have a look at those, that nativity scene and remember the star, remember the stable, remember the manger and, and humble yourself, bow your knee before God and ask for repentance. Say, God, I'm sorry that I've had this attitude of that I'm better than or that I'm selfish and that I'm only doing things to please myself. But forgive me and show me how I can live my life in honor of you, Lord. Amen? Amen. So I hope that this will make um, your Christmas um, with a new choice. That, that, that this season we, we will be able to, to look at this Christmas story with, with, a different, with a different perspective and a different light. And I, I mean, I can just say, like, ask God to make your ordinary life into something extraordinary. And it's not for you, it's for Him, it's for His glory, right? We don't do this for us. I don't do this for me. I do this because I want you to know what Jesus Christ can do to someone's life. He will turn it upside down and he will take you so far that you can't imagine that he can do it. And he can do it. And it, and, and it doesn't mean that you don't have struggles. It doesn't mean that you don't go over the bumps and lumps in life. But it just means that it's so much better with Christ. Amen? Amen. So we're going to finish um, our service today by singing um, one of my favorite um, Christmas hymns is Joy to the World. And, and I want us to remember that this was joy to the world because the Lord did come. And so let earth receive this King and let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. So prepare your heart for receiving Jesus in a new way this this um, Christmas season. Amen?